welcome to our live event on the progress towards the Green Deal goals and a new tool to track it, the Green Deal Radar or Compass. Uh, this event is organized in partnership with Sciences Po Paris and its Center for Economic Research, the Observatoire Francais des Conjonctures Économiques, aka OFCE. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, before introducing our guests for today's conversation, we very warmly thank Vox Europe subscribers and shareholders for their support. Their support enables us to keep hosting such events, keep translating and publishing quality journalism throughout investigations and great cartoons, and last but not least, to stay independent. Speaking of support, we are launching today a new subscription campaign with the new offers, including a special offer for students that we invite you to discover here in the chat. We're also offering new subscribers benefits, such as the chance to vote for investigative stories, a behind the scenes newsletter, live events, and more. Our campaign will come to an end after the European election, so don't hesitate to join and spread the word. Note also that this event is being recorded. Recorded. The recording will be available on our website in a few days. Uh, with regards to questions, you will be able to make to ask some questions to our guests in the chat in the language of your choice, and we will translate them. We will activate your microphone in like 20 minutes or so before the end, so you will be able also to have an informal chat with our guests. Now, before we start, and as a tradition at Vox Europe, please write in the chat box where you are based currently. I am Gianpaolo Cardo, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Vox Europe, and I'm based in Brussels. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining. Um, so the subject of today, uh, with its goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, the European Green Deal is crucial to the EU's green transition policy. How much progress has, it, has the European Union made since its launch five years ago? Is it achieving its objectives? Is it on the right track? What are the weaknesses or gaps? The Green Deal gave the European Union a true ambition with a reduction of 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions before 2030 compared with the 1990 level. But given the difficulty of tracking the Green Deal's progress, a group of researchers from Sciences Po Center for Economic Research in Paris, Éloi Laurent, Jérôme Creel, I hope I pronounce your name properly, by the way, Emma Lavessière have developed a comprehensive statistic tool, the Green Deal Radar or Compass. So let's, let me introduce you, uh, Eloi, Jérôme and Emma. Eloi, you're a senior researcher fellow of OFCE. You teach at Sciences Po, Pont Paris Tech and Stanford University, and your fields of research are ecological economics and social ecology. Jérôme, you are, you've been director of the research department at the OFC Sciences Po since January 2014. You are also associate professor of economics at ESCP Business School, having joined the school in September 2007. Emma, you're an economic student at the Toulouse School of Economics, and you have created and developed the Green Deal Compass website and app. So we start with you, Eloi. What is the Green Deal Compass? What does it bring to our understanding of the European debates and policies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, hello to all. I'm uh, extremely pleased to uh, present this uh, new tool that we have created. Um, thank you for joining us live. Thank you also for catching up this, uh, for catching up on this on this video um, in this period where everyone is. Um, um, away and dealing with all kinds of uh, um, holidays. Uh, so I will share my screen. Here is what we have tried to do with this Green Deal Compass. So the name of the tool is the Green Deal Compass. And uh, this is basically the outcome of a collaborative, uh, collaborative work between uh, myself, Jérôme and Emma for the last uh, months. Uh, it's an idea that we have been uh, having with Jerome for many months now, and uh, Emma was really the engine that uh, helped us uh, really achieve uh, this goal that we that we had. So I think it's fair to say that everyone contributed to this uh, to this project, uh, and we are very happy to share with you what is 
at the moment a beta version of the project, but I think already uh, we can see a lot of very interesting features and ideas and results uh, stemming from from this. Let me start with, and of course, thank you very much for uh, to Vox Europe, to Catherine, to Jean Paolo for hosting us. And uh, we have written a paper uh, on the website where we are presenting a number of ideas, but I'm going to add to that uh, as we go along. All right, so let me start with uh, maybe the context um, uh, of the European public debate, okay? Um, if you know uh, the uh, public debate in Europe, and I'm, I know that there are some participants who know that very well, um, you have essentially two narratives uh, right now uh, about the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, EGD, right? Uh, the first narrative, which is the most common one, is that the European Green Deal is under threat, is under attack by what uh, happens to uh, be something we can call anti-ecological populism, that is, uh, conservative and far-right uh, political parties and movements attacking environmental policy, arguing that environmental policy is basically harming uh, the livelihood of Europeans. And because they now enjoy a momentum in the political debate, uh, some people think that uh, they might even gain a majority. And because of that, uh, that the European Green Deal is going to be weakened and perhaps even dismantled uh, come uh, June 2024. Uh, if you believe in this narrative, you still uh, need to track the Green Deal with um, specific uh, analytical framework and indicators because you need to track the regression that is going to happen after June 2024. So if you think that the Green Deal might be dead after June 2024, you still need to know uh, how much we are going to take away from the Green Deal. And so you need to track the regression and you need to have a tool in order to do that. And our position is that there is no clear tool to track the Green Deal, even if uh, it's in the form of the regression of the Green Deal. And if you believe the other narrative, which is my case, I have to say, uh, which is that actually uh, there is a path dependency in the EU so that you don't get to come win election and then just uh, break uh, what you don't like in the EU. Uh, the European Green Deal is actually now embedded in many legal texts and many legal uh, institutional framework. And so because of this path dependency, uh, I think the European Green Deal is actually going to survive uh, the European election. And if it's the case, then you still need a tool to track the Green Deal, but this time to track its progress rather than its regression. And so whatever narrative you believe in uh, of these two, uh, you still need to have a proper tool to understand where we are with the Green Deal. And uh, really the point of departure of our reflection is that um, um, despite appearances, uh, despite, despite the fact that we are having uh, really, you know, very heated debates about the European Green Deal and what it does and what it is and what it does to uh, the, the lives of Europeans. The reality is that we don't know exactly how we are doing when it comes to the, the Green Deal, how much of the Green Deal has been achieved uh, in terms of really the goals that we have set ourselves and that are now very clear in the legal text uh, of the EU. And so this is really what we want to do with uh, the, the Green Deal compass. Let's start with uh, the current, um, the existing analytical framework of the Green Deal and maybe um, its limitations. Uh, this is the way the Green Deal was presented in the December 2019 uh, communication by the European Commission, so the original text of the Green Deal, and unless I'm mistaken, but I don't think that it has evolved a lot when it comes to analytical framework. And what you see here is a number of targets, goals, uh, aspirations, uh, but you don't really see what is the organization, what is the hierarchy, what is the thinking behind uh, this uh, project? Uh, what is really the ultimate goal? What are the intermediate goals? Uh, how all uh, is connected? So you have essentially, based on color codes, 
three items here. The one is mobilizing research and fostering innovation, which is a bit of a standalone in the representation. Then you have eight goals in green. Okay, so for instance, a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. And then you have two, I would say, um, maybe transversal or uh, um, 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 practical tools, which is financing the transition and leave no one behind, which would be the just transition. And then you have those two things, which is on the one hand, a European climate pact, and on the other, the EU as a global leader. And we are left with trying to understand what it all means. And so I think uh, it's not uh, too severe criticism to say that this uh, framework is not exactly helpful in understanding how the Green Deal can be organized. And so I think there is room for improvement when it comes to the analytical framework of the Green Deal. Then when it comes to the empirical framework, what you have is the really excellent job done by Eurostat in collecting data that might be useful or helpful for achieving the Green Deal. But what is a bit surprising, if you go on the website uh, of Eurostat, which is statistics for the European Green Deal, is that they? it seems that Eurostat has its own objectives, uh, which are not really connected with the European legal text of the Green Deal. So you have, if you look uh, um, right there on the menu, reducing our climate impact, but reducing our climate impact is not actually uh, the goal of the Green Deal. The Green Deal is to become the first climate neutral continent. And that's not uh, similar to uh, reducing our climate impact. The second goal is protecting our planet and health, but protecting our planet and health is not a goal of the Green Deal, okay? Not uh, as such. And then enabling a green and just transition, and it is, um, I would say, uh, put by Eurostat as one of the three pillars of the Green Deal, but we saw previously that this is one of the aspects of it. And if you look at the indicators that are being presented, the first three, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, well, certainly that's one objective of the Green Deal, but there's no specification of the goal of how much we should reduce greenhouse gas emission. And if you look at the graph, you don't really know if we are doing, doing well or doing poorly when it comes to this indicator, because there is no mention of exactly you know, uh, what uh, exactly we are aiming for. So you don't really know if uh, it's actually going in the right way, in the right direction. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions by sector is not actually an object, an objective of the Green Deal in the text and not uh, as, for instance, energy specifically, all right? It's, it's actually much more precise than that. It has to do with energy efficiency, for instance. And then climate-related economic losses, uh, which apparently are going up, and it's certainly not a good thing. But again, it's not an objective of the Green Deal to reduce climate-related economic losses. And if you um, uh, look at the, uh, the at the whole set of indicators uh, that Eurostat has put together, according to those three objectives, again, there are many interesting uh, indicators in there, but it's not really related to the Green Deal as it is um, in the text, and that is uh, not really related to the Green Deal as it has developed in 2020 and 2023. By the way, um, I, I sometimes uh, say that the Green Deal is a resilient accident in the sense that if you think that the Green Deal is going to be derailed by the June 2024 election, you need to realize that uh, the Green Deal has been hit by a number of shocks uh, since its uh, launching in December 2019, starting, of course, with uh, the COVID pandemic, but it has basically grown uh, stronger out of every shock. It has accelerated, uh, you know, after every shock. So uh, it is really resilient. And the Green Deal itself actually was an accident. It wasn't on any on anybody's platform in June 2019, you know, for the elections. And it was really born out of an improbable compromise between the center right. Uh, and the center left. And so it's it's fair to say that the Green Deal is a resilient accident and that, you know, again, it, it has proven, I think, quite resilient. So to come back to the empirical framework, again, those indicators are really interesting uh, and useful, but they seem to be a bit disconnected 
uh, from uh, the overall project of the Green Team. So what we decided with Jérôme and Emma is to build our work on some uh, very simple, but I think uh, strong principles. The first principle is that we want to have an analytical view of the Green Deal uh, and on how to measure and track the Green Deal, meaning we need to, to organize the different dimensions of the Green Deal in a way that makes sense for the overall uh, project and ambition that the Green Deal is, because you need to keep in mind that that's an ambition for decades to come. Again, to argue that the Green Deal is going to disappear after June 2024 is is doesn't make much sense when it comes to the importance of the European Green Deal in the overall uh, European project. So we need to have some kind of analytical model, and I'm going to present uh, uh, in the next slide the kind of understanding of the Green Deal that you might have. The second principle is that we want to have all the Green Deal, but only the Green Deal, meaning that in 2022-2023, you had some specific legal texts in which you have some specific targets, and you need to have all of the targets that were enshrined in European legal texts, because these are the things that are going to stay uh, uh, for years and maybe decades to come. All right, so we need to capture those different uh, targets. And again, there are not hundreds of them, but there are some of them that you need to keep in mind. The third principle is that we want to have a European view of the Green Deal, because the Green Deal is not uh, just the sum of its parts. It's a European strategy. It means that it's a, a cooperation strategy. And so it's not based on disciplines. You need to have, let's say, stability and growth pact. Uh, rules that apply to all member states to constrain their policies. It's not a beauty context in which uh, Germany is supposed to be better than France and France better than Italy, which is basically the way uh, a lot of European debates um, uh, um, run these days, although it has been inverted uh, in recent years, but I'm not going to get into that. And it's not a race to the bottom. Okay, so it's so what we focus on is the aggregate of the performance of the EU and not the member states in order to avoid this uh, temptation of ranking and you know and then uh, shaming and, and blaming. And the fourth principle is that we want to track tangible progress with the distance to target methodology, meaning that the tool, thanks to uh, Emma's uh, skills, is uh, real-time data connected to Eurostat databases so that each time Eurostat adds a new data point, the tool uh, integrates the change, okay? And we track the progress with 2030 uh, targets because the targets, you know, uh, the 2050 targets uh, look really nice, but it's a long way uh, from here. And 2030 is, on the contrary, a uh, very tangible horizon. And so we are basing uh, really all the, all, the, all the work on the evaluation of the distance to target with 2030 uh, legal goals. So again, the goals that are have been voted, have been agreed upon, and are now parts uh, of the law of the land of the EU. Okay, so let me go back to the analytical framework. Uh, there are two simple representations of the Green Deal, which I think um, help to make sense of the whole project. If you look at the different goals of the Green Deal, um, you can say that the Green Deal relies on four pillars and that each pillar, of course, is important because in the representation of the European Green Deal really supported by four pillars, if you take out one pillar, then you will have an imbalance and the whole thing might fall apart because of that, all right? so. The first pillar is obviously climate neutrality, and this is what we call in the uh, the, the Green Deal compass, the climate energy pillar. Okay, uh, you have targets, and they are actually the most numerous ones based on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and energy. Okay, the other pillar is economic metabolism, and by that I mean, uh, on the one hand, resource use, and on the other, waste. 
That is the way we are using natural resources in the EU and the way we are, um, uh, you know, producing waste and putting it back into the biosphere. Then provisioning system, uh, this is really food and agriculture pillar of the Green Deal, which is quite important. And finally, uh, the life support system, which is biodiversity and ecosystems. So you have four pillars, all right? It's not just about climate neutrality. It's climate and energy, resource and pollution, uh, and, and waste, but there are no indicators of waste uh, as of now, food and agriculture, and ecosystem and biodiversity. And you could even actually organize this in a way that makes even more sense, which is basically a pyramid in which you have this, the top of the pyramid, which is to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. But this is actually determined by other levels of the pyramid. And this is interesting because, for instance, if you have a base of the pyramid, which is not uh, really robust and which is weakened, which is biodiversity and ecosystem, you will have trouble achieving the top of the pyramid. And so it also almost makes more sense to organize it this way. And keep in mind this idea of the pyramid because it will help us understand uh, some of our key results later on. So what we have built is what we call the Green Deal Compass. Why a compass? Because, because a compass helps you uh, navigate, helps you find your way. And the way is, again, a number of objectives, but for that you need a tool to go from where you are and to reach the direction that you are aiming for. And for that, you need a compass, all right? The compass is made of two components. The first component is the 13 existing indicators with 2030 targets that are enshrined in EU law. So our criterion here was, it has to be in the text, in the EU legal framework, okay? It has to have 2030 targets and you only have 13 existing indicators doing that, okay? And then we organize those indicators into those, so those four different pillars, all right? This is a dashboard. This is essentially a Green Deal dashboard, all right? And then we built one synthetic indicator that we call the Green Deal radar. Now, a radar, what is a radar? Is a tool that helps you understand what are the obstacles in front of you, all right? This is a radar. So a radar, is going to be helpful in understanding, for instance, some imbalances that uh, you can have in the Green Deal achievement and that might be helpful going forward to achieve the Green Deal. So this is what we have built, okay? On the one hand, a dashboard, and then a synthetic indicator, uh, which is the Green Deal radar. So the better version of the, uh, of the website and the app that Emma uh, has, has built, and I have to say immediately that Emma I didn't want to talk. So I'm talking on behalf of her, but I'm not talking in as a sort of uh, moral authority on top of Emma, all right? I'm just doing this because Emma didn't want to, to talk, but she would be uh, happy to answer your questions. But here, it's really her hard work that I am just showcasing, uh, uh, okay? So, uh, but this is still a beta version, all right? We we need to to improve, for instance, the, the 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 some visuals and everything. But I think we have a lot of already what we want to achieve, and this is why we felt that the tool was ready actually to be presented. So what we have, what what you will be seeing if you are going on the website, um, and I will give you the the address at the end of the talk. Um, is this Green Deal compass, and the first page is the Green Deal radar, which I will say more about in a minute. And then you have the four pillars that I was talking about, climate and energy, resources and pollution, agriculture and food, ecosystem and biodiversity. Already, we feel that this is a contribution because, again, the European Green Deal has not been presented in this very simple and, I think, intuitive and um, relevant way when it comes to what the project is and, and what it really relies upon to be a success. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the web page, all right? And so I'm going to focus first on the Green Deal radar. Um, so the radar, uh, I think here, you have two critical information that is given by the radar. So what is it? It's in percentage how much we have achieved in terms of the distance to the 2030 targets for each pillar. 
So each pillar has, let's say, three, four, five indicators. And for each indicator, we have calculated the distance to target uh, and the target being the 2030 goal. And we have uh, expressed this distance in terms of the percentage, percentage that has been achieved. So if you look at the top of the radar for the first pillar, climate and energy, already, if you are using the latest available data, and I think it's 2022, okay, we have already achieved almost two thirds of the distance to actually reach the 2030 climate and energy targets, okay? And what we are doing here is that we are averaging the four or five indicators that we have and the uh, uh, proportion of achievement for each indicator. And that gives us an aggregate uh, proportion of achievement for the first pillar, All right? So here you can see that if you look at the Green Deal as really achieving uh, climate neutrality, and those climate and energy indicators, we are doing quite well. Okay, we are, we are already achieving two thirds, basically, of what we need to do. Okay, so this is the first information, and what we immediately see is that it's not the case for the other three pillars. And this is interesting because if you think about the metaphor of the pyramid, it means that actually the Green Deal today resembles a pyramid in the sense of the top being really developed, but the base not that developed. And that might be a problem if there is a relation between achieving the top and solidifying or consolidating the base. And I think it's exactly what our analysis shows. That, for instance, if you want to achieve climate neutrality, you need to reduce greenhouse gas emission in gross terms, but you also need to have strong biodiversity in ecosystems because in the end, you want to achieve, to achieve zero net emissions. And if you have a biodiversity and ecosystems that are not doing that well, okay, and ecosystems are actually being weakened, in the end, you might end up not achieving your climate goals because you have not paid attention enough to the fact that those different pillars are actually interconnected. And this is how, why the image of the pyramid, I think, is really relevant. All right? So that is the first information that you have. And the second information that you have is the overall uh, area that is being covered, uh, regardless of how much each pillar has achieved, you have an overall area. And this is basically almost half of it, 45% of it. But I think this indicator is not that relevant. We should really break it down by pillar to understand what we have. And so our conclusion, and maybe this is the main takeaway message of this presentation, is that yes, we are achieving the Green Deal, but at the cost of an imbalance between the, its different pillars. And this imbalance might actually jeopardize the whole thing going forward. Because again, uh, climate and energy need actually to have other pillars also, um, um, let's say, um, solidify or consolidate. So that's the first thing, okay? Uh, the first result. Then if you look at the detail of the pages that you will find, I'm not saying this is beautiful, but I'm saying maybe this is interesting, okay? And and we are really focused on here uh, bringing the data to the public debate because we think that those data actually are missing from the debate. And once again, we are having a sort of paradoxical debate in Europe where everyone is talking about the Green Deal and the revolt against the Green Deal, et cetera, but we don't know exactly uh, you know, um, you know, how well we are doing with the Green Deal. So I think we are bringing this to the table, right? Um, so uh, here we, you have three information which are interesting for the debate. The first information is the evolution of the data according to the data that we have uh, from the first data that was, the first data points that was uh, published by Eurostat up until the latest available data. And once again, keep in mind that Emma very cleverly has built in a mechanism by which this is uh, automatically updated. So this is real-time progress towards those goals, all right? So the graph here helps you see, uh, for instance, very interestingly for carbon sinks, that carbon sinks, that is the amount of greenhouse gas emission that are, uh, that, uh, are being taken up by, by natural uh, sinks, uh, has remained constant for a number of years, but it has, in recent years, collapsed. 
And this is extremely interesting as an information because it means that if you want to achieve a zero net emission, you need to have carbon sinks that absorb greenhouse gas emissions. And if you are doing well on reducing greenhouse gases emission in gross terms, but then your carbon sinks are actually collapsing, you will have a major problem going forward because it means that you cannot count on carbon sinks to actually absorb the amount of carbon that you will not have been able to reduce in gross terms, okay? So that is actually a debate that we are not seeing today in the EU and we should have. Because if you have, you know, mega fires that destroy your ecosystems and destroy the system by which you can absorb carbon, regardless of the efforts that you're going to put in reducing emissions from, let's say, mobility or housing, you are going to have a problem achieving your targets. So the first information here is the, the graph. The second ever information is the progress towards targets that 67%, uh, all right? So it's quite, quite good, all right? And the third information is this red arrow, which is indicating how we are doing with the latest data point, because the performance overall can be good, but then you look, you need to look at what are the latest data points to understand what is the direction of the really uh, few years uh, since, uh, you know, let's say the two or three previous years to know in, why, in which direction you are heading, okay, in the most recent period. And again, you might be doing well, uh, you know, in, in overall terms, which is the case for carbon sinks. But the concern here is that the latest years are actually not good at all. And it could be related to the shocks, the climate shocks that ecosystems are um, facing in the EU. In other words, the climate crisis might impede our ability to mitigate the climate crisis. Okay, And again, I'm not seeing this very clearly expressed in the European public debate. So these are the information that we are bringing uh, uh, to the table. And I think that, or at least we have not been able to find them uh, clearly uh, uh, in, the, in the debate. So that's a graph for pillar one, okay? A very interesting graph for pillar two is the direction of domestic material consumption. And if you look at the graph, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, you can see that basically we have stopped making progress when it comes to domestic material consumption. In other words, the economic metabolism of the, uh, of the EU is actually not good when it comes to natural resource consumption. And that might be a very important problem uh, going forward. And the, the latest years are not good uh, uh, also, right? And we are not doing well on this, which is a measure of sustainability, which is how much natural resources we need to have the European economy actually function, right? Um, then on the third pillar, one of the interesting graphs that we have is the use of chemical pesticides. And we, are all, we have only achieved 20% of uh, the road that we need to cover up until 2030. And that's interesting because we are seeing a revolt. You know, we have seen in recent months a revolt of farmers in the EU uh, claiming that the European Green Deal is basically a huge obstacle uh, for their uh, activity and industry, but we are not doing good at all on uh, the, the, you know, uh, the uh, trying to, to uh, um, alleviate, uh, mitigate, uh, uh, the chemical um, components of uh, agri um, uh, of industrial agriculture. Okay, so that's also an interesting uh, thing that we can um, uh, gather from our work. And finally, which is probably the most concerning of all the indicators, well, certainly the most concerning of all the indicators that we um, have put in the Green Deal Compass, the state of uh, bird conservation. You might know that. The indicators for ecosystems and biodiversity are not uh, well developed today in European text. Why? Because they are basically it's work in progress and they are being developed as we speak. But those that are there, uh, land conservation and marine area conservation is really good. But biodiversity is probably collapsing in the EU. And of course, bird uh, is one uh, a component, but it might be a really relevant one. And uh, we really should be aware that we have this huge problem. And the Green Deal is not just about climate. It's also about uh, biodiversity. 
All right, so I will close this uh, by, of course, uh, telling you what you probably uh, have understood now, and especially I'm, I, I know that there are participants who are really interested in the social dimension and that might be frustrated uh, to see that there are no really social indicator in this work. Um, you might be aware that uh, a lot of work is going on uh, on this idea of the social deficit of the Green Deal, but here the exercise is not about an aspirational Green Deal. It's not about of you know to 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 say the Green Deal that we would want is to try to measure the Green Deal as it is. So it it might be a bit uh, frustrating, but at least this is what we have, and it's, it's, it, precisely because the social dimension is so uh, little developed in the Green Deal, you don't have those indicators. Uh, of, of social justice. So let me just recap uh, what we need to do um, uh, going forward. Uh, we need to have feedback, including from uh, people participating in this um, uh, in this presentation. And we also need partners uh, to move beyond the better version. That is, we need to have EU institutions, organization uh, willing to fund us, to help us, and to make sure that this tool is being developed uh, because I think it's really promising, but of course, it's also very preliminary as it is, okay? Uh, we also, of course, need more indicators and data points, and we are going to have them uh, built in automatically in our tool, once again, thanks to Emma. Um, but uh, also, there are some indicators that are missing. Uh, for instance, the ecosystems and biodiversity pillar, uh, we will see more indicators uh, in months uh, uh, to come. We have identified some imbalances, and I would say some key imbalances, but they are mostly ecological imbalances because we, once again, have based our work on what uh, already exists and has been voted on. But of course, there is this, qu this question of the social deficit of the Green Deal and how to integrate the justice dimension of those indicators. And, and for instance, fuel poverty. Uh, and, and, and of course, we need to have uh, uh, some some uh, uh, some way to do that, and that might mean that we need to have another uh, tool than the Green Deal radar, uh, something else, another graph, another visualization of how the justice dimensions and the social dimensions really play uh, in interaction with the ecological dimension. But again, this is not uh, um, present today in the Green Deal, so this is part of some other work that I'm. I'm, I'm doing, but also many other people are doing about transforming Green Deal into a social and Green Deal. Uh, there's a paper coming out um, next week on that. And finally, and this is going to be the segue to Jérôme's uh, presentation, we need to connect indicators with policies and governance. That is, how do you uh, move those indicators forward uh, using what kind of policies and what kind of governance? And this is uh, also a very important part of uh, the way this could be useful. So to, just to end this, uh, this the, the Green Deal Compass is now online. Um, you can access it at this address. Of course, we are going to post the slides um, and you can see Green Deal Emma. So Emma has you know, uh, um, embedded herself right there you know, with the Green Deal. This is really the Green Deal of, of Emma, or Emma's Green Deal, right? Um, so this is the, the, the address. And if you uh, want to send us some feedback and if you want to contact us, uh, please use our address, Jérôme and um, Jérôme Krill, who's going to speak in a moment, and myself. Um, and we would be, of course, happy to, uh, uh, to discuss it with you and move forward with it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I now uh, give the floor to Jérôme. Thank you very much, uh, Edouard. This is uh, most interesting. So Jérôme, it's your turn. And I will yes. take the chance just to say that um, we will uh, take your questions if we have the time. I think some of the questions Jan Parlo and I had already prepared have already been answered. So I think we will integrate the questions of the audience uh, as soon as Jérôme is finished. So please write them down and keep them in mind. Thank you, Jérôme, it's your turn. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jean Paolo and Catherine, for asking us. For And uh, thanks to all the team at Vox Europe to make uh, a tremendous work. Uh, I'm very happy to to speak after after Eloa and say uh, how happy I've been to, to, 
to work with with him about this app with Elwa and him about this app and uh, it is a uh, very nice work and uh, I I will be uh, as short as possible. I just wanted to 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 mention one thing and I and I'm done. Uh, Elwa has been speaking about the imbalances uh, between the different pillars within the radar, which are very important, showing that in some directions the EU has been performing rather well, but at the expense maybe of, of some other important parts of uh, ecological problems like uh, the, the loss of biodiversity. There is a, another imbalance that we wanted to, 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 to feel, uh, feeling that there was a, a hole in discussion, which is the gap between what we have already been achieving as regards the ecological transition within the European Green Deal, and all the discussions that are being made mostly by economists and macroeconomists about the large amounts of money that are being devoted to, to the questions of the ecological transition. We are certainly all aware of the existence of this uh, next generation EU program, this uh, recovery and resilience facility that were born in July 2020, uh, within which there is 800 billion euros worth of money, 37% of which will be dedicated to uh, the ecological transition. And some may be arguing, and I recall the different narratives it was mentioning a few minutes ago, there are many arguing that we're doing too much for uh, the European Green Deal. There's way too much money on the European Green Deal. And what the radar is showing is that we've not been delivering enough. So does this mean that all this amount of money we're talking about has been badly used? No, no, for the amount of money devoted to next generation EU, this 800 billion euros has not been used. We have not seen that money arrive in the different projects that should have been funded, there's on, there are only three countries in the EU that have so far used 60% of the grants they were being allocated. There are many countries that are not even using the loans they have been allocated. So we see kind of a discrepancy between communication on we're doing as much as we can, as fast as we can on the ecological transition and see, we put so much money. And in the end, there is a wide imbalance between what we communicate upon and what the data tell us. In terms of the EU amounts, for instance, not so much money devoted to that. And now with the radar that is very clear, very far from achieving the results. And we are a few weeks before and important elections uh, at the European Parliament. We are before uh, a moment when most EU countries will have to perform some fiscal austerity, and we're still having so much to do to perform that ecological transition. So this radar has been showing a, a very wide trade-off between what we are supposed to do and the limited amounts that we devote to it, either collectively, that's the next generation EU, there's still money to be, to be used, but still unused. And on the other hand, the new fiscal rules that will apply very shortly and that will limit the scope for our governments to fight the ecological transition. So that, that, that means what? That this radar makes it clear that we are very far still from the expected objective, which is also the good objective we should be giving to ourselves. So certainly we've not been doing too much, but certainly considering the radar, way too little. I stop there and I hope we will be having a discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jérôme. Uh, well, this is not very uh, encouraging. Nevertheless, um, I, I wanted to ask Emma a question because we, we've been praising her work uh, until now, uh, which is quite impressive. But 
um, I would be curious to know, Emma, which uh, which were the major uh, challenges or issues that you faced uh, in creating this compass, apart from discussing with those two gentlemen, of course, of course. Uh, yes, um, as uh, Eloi said before, uh, the data com comes from uh, Eurostat uh, website, and uh, I think the challenge was to keep it up to date uh, in real time. Um, so uh, if uh, Eurostat uh, adds a new line of data for a new year, the application will be automatically updated, and uh, I think uh, that was uh, the challenge for there will be a free version and then a premium version that you can apply for with special pictures and updates. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the, the beta version, uh, I think, uh, will be available. And then we are hoping that we're going to work on uh, a more sophisticated version and then we'll see how. But I mean, I think uh, this is really a tool for the public debate. So even if some EU institution or EU organization uh, would want to, it makes no sense to have this, uh, you know, not publicly and freely available, basically. So I think, well, I'm, I'm only speaking for myself, but I think I, I don't see another model for the, this, uh, this work. If I may add something, uh, as you certainly understood, uh, the, all the data are uh, uh, public data. So we are just constructing an application based on public data to make uh, the analysis of the European Green Deal consistent with the EU laws that have been passed so far. So our main uh, originality here is to have namely the four pillars that relate to the four kind of wide topics that the European Green Deal is about. And then we take the different indicators that are in these EU laws and based on how much uh, the EU has been performing in this regard, we put it in the data over time and in the radar. So we, I can't imagine why it shouldn't be public. These are public data. This is a convenient, smart, I'd say, way of dealing with the EGD it's about climate, but not only about climate. And this is Ursula von der Leyen that has told us so. So we put the commission before its decisions, the European Parliament before its decision, and we let the public see it. So the wider it will be used, the, the better for us. And since it can be updated, provided you go there and ask for the data, uh, it, it can last as long as still Eurostat lasts, but also the European Green Deal. Yes. Thank you, Jérôme. But um, what kind of, what possible changes do you think or do you hope it might foster? I suppose it's just was a way of really day by day, to, by on a day to day basis, almost following, tracking the, the advancements of the Green Deal. But uh, beyond that, I suppose it could create more awareness, possibly. If I, if I may start and I leave uh, Irwa and Emma give their, their feeling. Uh, one thing that we think was very important and Irwa mentioned it is that the European Green Deal is not a problem of one member state and not another one. It's an EU radar that we wanted to build and there's no questioning the fact that maybe France has done better for this and this reason than Slovenia, for instance. We don't really care. The problem is we have a world issue that we try to tackle at the EU level so that we would be very happy if people were looking at the radar and say, okay, the EU has performed relatively well, can improve in this direction, and everybody should be going in the same direction. If there are problems within the family, it rests within the family, and we try to figure out how to improve how the family is being looked at uh, by foreigners. So I, I think it's it's a benchmarking that, that we're showing. And it's also very easy to see how far we are from some objectives that the EU gave itself, which is a bit weird sometimes to say, okay, we hear the commission saying we've been delivering. 
but we look at the result and we're very far from the objectives and beware you gave yourself the objective so we are trying to have an eu discussion with Eurostat data. So this is not a question of where the data are coming from. We know where they're coming from. What are the different computations you've been doing? They're not very complex, these computations. They are easily redone uh, on a piece of sheet. And if you want a clear evaluation of where we stand, this is the radar. And unfortunately, the European Commission has done it before because it should have been done by other institutions that the three of us, we're not an institution, we're part of some, but, but we considered one year and a half ago with Edwa, it was a pity that we would be going to this new European election without knowing clearly what we had achieved so far. So we will see. No, I think we are an institution, the three of us. I mean, I see us as an institution. Uh, so, but, what 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 we want to do is really to inform the public debate with what we um, have the capacity to do, which is to organize data. I think the 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 part of the problem of our world is that we have this data deluge and not so much data analysis. Uh, and 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 so I think this is very simple in a way, uh, uh, very simple. And it was also very organic. Uh, the Green Deal radar, for instance, showed up really in the last weeks of the pro of the of the project. And so I think it's just a way to organize this debate in the more sophisticated way than just say you are for or against the Green Deal. Uh, I think a lot of you know uh, the premise of the debate is that the Green Deal is whether very good or very bad for Europeans. And this is not the kind of, you know, simplistic debate that we can afford in the EU. So the first objective is to have an informed and, you know, um, um, reasonable and relevant debate about the Green Deal. It's here. I think it's here to stay. And we need to look at it uh, with its strengths and weaknesses. Um, and of course, we want to convince EU institutions that uh, we can move on this uh, being informed. And so, for instance, putting here very clearly the focus on uh, the, the, the lack of progress when it comes to biodiversity and ecosystems. This is one important dimension that we are having a debate. Most of the people think that ecological transition is just energy climate transition. And most of the people understand the European Green Deal as just a climate strategy. It's more than that. It's a comprehensive strategy. And again, you also need to add the social dimension to really make it a social ecological strategy. But if you just consider the ecological strategy, uh, it's very important to understand, especially if you are having the kind of zero net uh, emission strategy that we are having. If you are having climate neutrality as an objective, then you need to have strong ecosystems in biodiversity. Otherwise, you are just transferring the climate crisis to uh, biodiversity and ecosystems. So to have just, you know, an informed debate about the European Green Deal, about its strengths, about its weaknesses. And I have to say, this is really the first time that we are presenting it. I, I've seen in the chat a question by Thierry uh, um, asking if, uh, what, what was the feedback from EU institutions? We have not presented it to NCU institutions. This is the first time we have given Vox Europe uh, really, the you know the the uh, the first presentation ever of this tool, um, and so and 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 so now the debate uh, will will begin, and hopefully uh, things uh, might uh, change from from it. But but I think the at OFCE, our mission is to inform the public debate with scientific independence and rigor, and I think this is exactly what we are trying to do here. Yeah, thank you, Eloi. Um, Jérôme has, uh, has mentioned earlier the fact that we are not doing uh, the progresses that we should uh, with regards of uh, three, at least three on over the four pillars uh, of the Green Deal. Um, so we, we have we had your assessment on this, but uh, lately several countries have started asking for a pause in the implementation of the Green Deal's provisions, in particular with regards to agriculture and transportation. Uh, do you think that this will um, be 
of would jeopardize even more the uh, the meeting of uh, the green deal goals in the mid term 2030 and possibly in the long term which is 2050 so thank you for the question so if if these posts were to be really implemented uh, and for long of course it would be jeopardize the the, uh, the performance of the European Green Deal, as we've seen it decline this performance when we were hit severely by the inflation shock, and the, some governments decided that they would be subsidizing our consumption of oil in our cars in order to reduce the impact of inflation on our purchasing power. So these decisions were going, uh, were contradicting the philosophy and the implementation of the European Green Deal. So if another post is being given and it lasts for long, of course, we will not achieve it. And uh, I don't know who in uh, science uh, has any arguments against the European Green Deal, except that of saying that we would need it to be a worldwide Green, green Deal, but the EU can decide for itself, not for all the rest of the world. I'd like to add another point, which is that uh, there are many political arguments that are being shared these days before the elections at the European Parliament. Uh, let's see what happens after the election. Uh, I've seen some surveys, uh, some other medias than yours, like political, with arguing that we will be having as many SND and EPP members of the European Parliament. And yes, the extreme right wing will be growing, but only at the expense of the Greens and at the expense of Renew Europe. So what does it mean? It may mean in the end that the policies that were being implemented so far during the last uh, period at the Parliament would continue being implemented that after some political arguments you will uh, decide that finally you will speak a bit less about Europe and continue with the European, European Green Deal as if nothing had happened. This is, I think, what may happen. Political arguments in the short term and the trend towards what we need in the longer term, uh, climate change mitigation, but not, not only that. Thank you, Jerome. We, we, and if we, I just we... can add to yes. that, just, sure. just a quick, quick word, Catherine, um, sure. that so uh, oppose, but oppose on what? And that might be the question that you might take from our presentation. That is, oppose, but oppose on things that we have not achieved is not oppose. So if you want oppose on, for instance, how we have been doing when it comes to food and agriculture, it's not oppose because there has been very little progress. So I think this is one thing that you can take away from, from the thing. I, I think what uh, Jerome just said is extremely important. The Green Deal was the product of a compromise between the center right and the center left. And it's possible that we have exactly uh, the same kind of majorities going forward. In other words, the Green Deal is here to stay. And the question is, again, how to make it better and how to better understand it and also how to make it something that Europeans really understand. Because in the end, it's not just about political uh, wins and losses. It's not just about institutional path dependency. It's also about the European model and the European values. I think that Europeans are really attached to climate change mitigation and really uh, doing something about the ecological crisis. And it's a very clear feature of the EU when compared to China and the US. And so to have a tool that allows Europeans to understand what exactly, how the Green Deal is aligned with their values, it's not, you know, a small, uh, a small thing. Um, I would thank everybody for attending and participating to this live event. And especially thank you so much, Eloi, Emma and Jerome for being with us today. Many thanks again to our subscribers and shareholders who make this possible, keeping you informed in full independence, translating our articles into five languages as a cost. We need your support, so don't hesitate to join us and subscribe to Vox Europe. The link is in the chat. And of course, spread the word about our subscription campaign. 
to mark the launch of our subscription campaign, the Vox Europe team has prepared a small video presenting the issues we tackle and the way we work in complete independence. We invite you to watch the video at the end of this live report. It will introduce you to the Vox Europe team. You can watch this video with subtitles in English, Francais, Italiano, Espanol, und Deutsch. Enjoy. And to see this and to see the video, just check the uh, the chat. There are all the links there. Thank you so much again, uh, Emma, Jerome, and Eloi. It's uh, really fascinating, and I hope this will Green Green Compass will uh, will be seen and uh, and will make a difference. So we have to make sure to to make uh, the right promotion for it. So we will edit this conversation, and we will soon receive. You will soon receive the video of the best moments and maybe the whole video actually of this live event. So don't hesitate, of course, to share it on all your networks. Keep posted to the next Vox Europe Live, which will be on 15th, the 15th of May with the Dutch expert Cass Müder, three weeks before the European election, we will discuss the rise of the extreme right-wing parties and we will announce uh, the, the, the time in a forthcoming newsletter. So, Thank you again. I don't know whether you want a, a last word, uh, Emma. Uh, thank you. A word of thank Hello. you. Thank you so much, thank uh, you so much. Catherine. Thank you, John Paolo. When this is really famous and it becomes, you know, it rules the whole European Union, you would know that it, it was presented first on Vox Europe. Yeah. So, thank we'll you. We'll keep record of it. Mm -hmm.